Hi, my name is Frank Schaefer, and I want to introduce you to two heroes of mine. They happen to be civil rights heroes who marched with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Norman Hill and Velma Murphy Hill have written a book about their involvement in the civil rights movement, and it's called Climbing the Rough Side of the Mountain. I got an advanced copy actually from my agent who happens to be their agent. And she told me, look, you have to read this book. And she was right. And you have to read it too. It's a beautiful, moving, inspiring book. And it's my, it has to be read, as we call it, book club offering for the month of February. I hope you'll check it out and enjoy my podcast as well. My name is Frank Schaefer. Today, I think that there is a need for a similar kind of coalition, a coalition that has to do with a woman's right to choose, coalition has to, to do with voting rights, civil rights, and religious freedom. Mm. Today, we're going to have to develop that coalition of people who are struggling for freedom and against tyranny. And we're going to have to do that again mm. for democracy. Hi, this is Frank Schaefer, and you are watching and or listening to Frank Schaefer uh, with my guest today. Uh, this is a podcast called In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. It goes live on Facebook first, then to YouTube, and then to all the other channels we're on, including most places that podcasts appear, Substack, and all the rest of that. Um, so with no further ado, I just want to jump right in and introduce the guests that we have today. Uh, Norman Hill and Velma Murphy Hill are authors of a book that I'm holding up here. And if... Um, you can see this. It's dog-eared. I just want to show you. I have lots of pages turned down, notes all through it, passages I want to quote. Um, oh, very good. Yeah, yeah. And I've read it, and I love this book. Uh, we'll we'll be talking about it in depth. Um, Climbing the Rough Side of the Mountain, the, Ext the Extraordinary Journey of Love, Civil Rights, and Labor Activism. It was published October 17, so this is a new book. Um, before I get going, I want to thank my agent, Jennifer Lyons, who has been handling my literary output for the last 20 years. And she is also the agent for these authors, Norma Hill and Velma Murphy Hill. She told me a long time ago, I'm handling an amazing book. Um, you're going to want to read it. And then later she got to me and said, why don't you do um, this book as a podcast. And, and I was already so interested in the project that, of course, I jumped at the chance. So first of all, thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, uh, Norman and Velma, for being here with me today. It's a real honor. Having read the book, I can say it's a real honor as well as a pleasure to talk to you. So thank you for being here. And thank you. Thank you for having us. So let me jump in. Uh, I've got so many quotes here, but I want to I want to start pretty far into the book with something that jumped out just on a personal note um, that I thought was a lovely way to begin the whole discussion here. It's actually way into the book on, on page 222. But as Norman's troubles worsened, and we're going to talk about the problems you had with your eyesight, um, and this is you writing, Velma, I just couldn't do that anymore. You have to understand that Norman and I, besides being husband and wife, are friends. Yes. We really are friends. We really care about each other. There were times when I would look at him and see the darkness closing in on him. I would just hold him. And I wanted to start with that because I think that when you when you read a book that is about a 60-year journey through the civil rights movement and the labor movement, and I want to really get into that because that's an amazing subject to talk about. You think of civil rights as one thing and the labor movement as another, and you've completely changed the way I see that history now because of your book. Be before we get there, I just want to say that it's such a wonderful love story. And as someone who's been married himself for the last 53 years to Jeannie, 
with lots of ups and downs. The first thing that touched me about your book was the love story. I just love your love story, if I can put it that way. And then we'll get to the politics and the labor movement and Martin Luther King Jr. and a lot of other stuff. But the first thing I want to say is unexpectedly climbing the rough side of the mountain is is a wonderful love story. And I, it was my pleasure and honor to, to, to get a little glimpse into your lives, just that part. So let's talk about that first, how you met a little bit, which of course I read in the book. And this incredible arch of a personal story that the book follows in a beautiful narrative. And you're both such good writers. Last thing I'm going to say, and then I promise you this is, I'm going to be talking very little for the rest of this and asking you questions. I thought that you came up with a terrific device for letting us know whose voice was ah. speaking in the italicized passages where all of a sudden you know you're reading Norman and then you know you're reading Velma and it was effortless. Um, and I just thought you did a terrific thing together. And, and really, it's an amazing book, but just being able to co-author a book together so seamlessly um, I just thought it was terrific. Okay, I'm going to shut up now and ask you about your lives together. This great story that I've just read, uh, it goes it goes back a long way. Um, introduce yourselves to people who haven't read the book. And again, here it is. And I'm going to be summing through this and showing you all some of the pictures in the book as well. There's a terrific photo section. We'll get to that in a minute. So I don't know which of you want to start, but Norma, uh, Norman or Velma, could you just introduce yourselves in terms of when you met, what year it was, and all the rest of it? I am Norman Hill, and Velma Murphy Hill and I met in 1960 on a picket line in Chicago. Uh, we, we were picketing in support of the Southern students who were sitting in at, at Woolworth's store. And we were in front of the Chicago Woolworths supporting their, their efforts to desegregate Woolworths. Um, we were introduced by my younger brother who said to Velma, you ought to meet my brother. He talks <laughs> strange or odd like you and maybe a socialist. So Velma introduced me and um, brother John introduced Velma to me and uh, we talked and Velma invited me to dinner. <laughs> and that was the that that was the beginning of a relationship that would go on for sixty three years of marriage and an extraordinary story of life, love, civil rights, and labor activism. Mm. By the by, the way, my mom cooked. I didn't cook. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, I want to jump to one thing here you have in the acknowledgments just to let people know, because you guys are so humble in your presentation of yourselves in the book. I just want you all to understand something that uh, <laughs> talking to Norman and Velma is a big deal. Let me tell you who has endorsed this book. I'll just run through some names and then we were going to get into the book. You have to understand this is not just an ordinary book. Um, Charlene Hunter Galt, the reporter, Reverend Al Sharpton. Congresswoman Maxine Waters, Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Congressman Robert C. Bobby Scott, Abraham Foxman, Mark Morio, Carl Gershman, Cleola Brown, Liz Schuler, Lee Saunders, Richard L. Trumpka, Mary Kay Henry, and William Julius Wilson. And when you look through the book, you're going to meet Martin Luther King Jr., who Norman and Belma worked with, and a lot of other folks. So I don't want to do any name dropping, but I just want people who are listening to this podcast to understand that these people we're talking to have not just participated in the making of the history of our country, they have witnessed it. 
And part of what I want to talk about today with Norman and Velma is just the arc of that witnessing. Cutting toward the end of the book, Velma, you have a passage at the end saying that there's things that give you pause and sorrow now, and that sometimes Norman is still more positive about the direction of our country, and sometimes you feel rather depressed by the way things are going. I know that's toward the end of the book, but let me just start there, because I, I want to probe your wisdom in terms of the direction of this country. And you talk about the Trump years, and of course, you had experience as labor organizers, even in Israel. You, you have a breadth of knowledge of the planet. You have traveled so much. You've organized the labor movement across the globe. I don't, you know, there's so much here, I hardly know where to start. But let's just start with you, uh, Velma, and this kind of, I won't say pessimistic view, but that there's enough going on now that is a bit of a disappointment in looking back over that arc in terms of, well, how much did we really manage to do, given that... Mm -hmm. I mean, the best example is we had our first black president and two minutes later, we're looking at Donald Trump, uh, you know, yeah. two steps forward, one or two steps back. Yeah. Let me get out of the way and just let you talk about what you see as the state of the nation right now. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for having us on and for listening to us. Uh, Norman and I uh I think we were soldiers in an army. Uh, and when we first met, we integrated Rainbow Beach. And because I was struck on the head with 17 stitches, the community came out to support us. Mm -hmm. And a coalition of forces, labor unions, um, community groups, religious groups, uh, and uh, civil rights groups came out and supported us. And, you know, today, I think that there is a need for a similar kind of coalition, a coalition that has to do with a woman's right to choose, coalition has to to do with voting rights, civil rights, um, and religious freedom. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, that occurred to us when we saw the emergence of, um, of I don't know, that guy. <laughs> Yeah, that guy. <laughs> that guy. The emergence of that guy and who supported him. Mm. And uh, it's really interesting because uh, in the, uh, I guess, 60s, 70s, uh, we struggled to defeat... Uh, Klansman David Duke. Klansman David Duke. Yeah. And prevent him from being governor. Mm. And, you know... It seems like today that we're going to... 1991. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, today, we're going to have to develop that coalition of people who are struggling for freedom and against tyranny. And we're going to have to do that again mm -hmm. for democracy. Mm -hmm. And I think that Norman and I understand that... Uh, we. Our country has uh, problems, mm. but we are the leaders in democracy around the world. Mm. And we have to be in favor of democracy for workers, for blacks, for Hispanics, for all kinds of minorities. We have to be in favor of developing coalitions and uh somehow it's it's like history repeating itself yeah. unfortunately yeah. and uh there there is a poem which uh I, I i i love because it says what i feel and that is freedom doesn't come like a bird on the wing doesn't come down like the summer's rain you got to fight for it 
You got to struggle for it day and night for it. And every generation has to win it again. So pass it on. And we have to pass it on. And I think that Norman and I and our love together will pass it on to whomever will listen. You know, the, speaking of being struck in the head with the rock, I, one of the touching passages in the book, and since it's in the book, I don't feel like I'm being too personal because you wrote it down, Yeah, um, is the fact that, that that blow in the head thrown by someone who was a racist, who didn't want you to integrate that beach. Yes. And that injury led to a serious medical problem where you then in the end, because of that, one thing led to another and you lost a child, you lost a pregnancy. That's correct. And, and we're not able after that to have more children, I don't think. That's and in correct. the book, in the book, you know, so speaking of dues paying, um, I just want to tell people who are listening to this, if you read the book, the dues were paid again and again by by both uh, Norman and, and Velma, but Velma in the most direct sense, that that injury almost killed you finally in terms of the complication that put you in a hospital. Yes. And you lost a child. Um, yeah, we was we were I was paralyzed for like six, seven months. Yeah. 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 And I, I, I just point that out on the way by. Let me jump into something that I really want to get into because it's so unique to your book. In fact, I, I read quite a bit. Forgive my ignorance, but I have not um, encountered this anywhere before. And I mentioned it before. And that is this correlation between the civil rights movement and the labor movement. And what amazed me is I just want to read something from page 244. Uh, Norman and I have worked with labor activists and leaders in such nations as, and this list is amazing, Israel, France, Germany, Switzerland, Canada, South Africa, Ghana, Nigeria, Senegal, Lesotho, <laughs> Tunisia, Brazil, El Salvador, Nicaragua, the Bahamas, and Jamaica. During our work in the U.S., we met with many international defenders of liberty and democracy. Among them was uh, Lech Wałęsa leader of Poland's anti-Soviet trade union solidarity, and eventually president of a free Poland, Soviet dissident Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and he gave us one of his autograph books. And I will never forget meeting Senegal's president and resident post-poet scholar Leopold Senhor in the country's sea-splashed capital of Dakar, uh, Dakar during one of my many trips to Africa. I think this is in your voice, isn't it? Um, yes, yes. This is you writing, isn't it, Velma? Yes, it uh, is. Yeah, in the country's uh, um, sea-splashed capital of Dakar during one of my many trips to Africa. He had just flown in from France, where he spent most summers. It was one of the most exciting times of my life. And then I'm going to just continue here a little bit, because in into, I believe, uh, Norman's voice here, the one thing that links all the international involvement work and exposure that Velma and I have had is the furtherance of democracy. If you are training trade unionists who will be free and independent, then that work is part of building a free and independent society. If a country has a free and independent labor movement, then it has a solid democratic institution. And I just love the way you work those themes together. And I'm stunned by the fact that professionally, both careers you got paid for plus activism you weren't paid for, Follow these twin paths, so so go there. I mean, and, you know, it's like meeting an oncologist who also happened to be, you know, a world's great chef. You don't see these things usually together. Trade union activism combined with, you know, you normally you don't think of these as one and the same. And I just love the way you tie it together in your book. So talk about that that symbiotic relationship in your own lives and how you see the issues of of trade unions and all the rest of it. You you want to take that, Norma? I'm well, a prime example from, from our own experience of labor and civil rights activism was what occurred when I went to Memphis, Tennessee in 1968 as a leader of the A. Philip Randolph Institute, an organization made up primarily of Black trade unionists, welcoming anyone sharing its commitment to racial equality and economic justice, acting as a bridge between the trade union movement and the civil rights movement, between organized labor and the black community. 
I went to Memphis to work with this the American Federation of State County Municipal Union staff and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference to organize community support for striking sanitation workers. Mm-hmm. Martin Luther King Jr. came to Memphis to lend his prestige and leadership to the campaign. I helped organize a march in support of the striking sanitation workers to City Hall in Memphis, led by Martin Luther King Jr. Youth participants in the march broke ranks and threw stones and rocks at store windows and began to loot. The police responded by tear gassing the march and Martin Luther King Jr. turned the march back to its point of origin. Depressed by the fact that for the first time, a march under his leadership experienced the breakdown in discipline, why join the staff in persuading Martin Luther King Jr. that he ought to lead a second march? indicating that this was a trade union struggle and that we would recruit union leaders and increase the labor presence to help maintain discipline. Martin Luther King began leading the organization of the second march when he was assassinated. Yes. Mm -hmm. We continue to organize the march despite the shocking experience of King's assassination. The march took place as a memorial to Dr. King and his support of striking sanitation workers who eventually gained union recognition and negotiated a collective bargaining agreement, bettering their wages, hours, and working conditions. But that's just one example of the intertwining of labor and civil rights in a kind of, in struggle that we were directly involved in. Mm-hmm. The question I have for you is that it seems to me that one of the problems the Democratic Party faces these days is that um, a lot of the identity politics has gotten in the way of what you were talking about earlier in terms of being understood as both a civil rights movement politically and socially and a labor movement and a union movement. You had a long history with the AFL-CIO and the formation of various uh, attachments to unions. Talk a little more about that, but also just get into this, this sort of slide away from being identified with American workers as part of a civil rights struggle representing all races uh, and backgrounds. And and I just think that both of your vision of this and the way you lived it out in your work is very unique, but it's also very instructive for the moment. You were talking about history repeating itself. We kind of need you back again, (laughs) leading us back into or opening doors in people's minds back into this idea that civil rights and all human rights go hand in hand with labor rights and union rights. And it's not something you hear talked about very much uh, these days. And I really want to just keep going there because I think you've got an absolutely unique voice in this that comes through in this book. By the way, let me just reintroduce it. You're listening to In Conversation with Frank Schaefer. We are talking with the authors of Climbing the Rough Side of the Mountain, The Extraordinary Story of Love, Civil Rights, and Labor Activism by Norman Hill and and Velma Murphy Hill. Here's the book. Fabulous photo section all the way through. Lots of pictures of the civil rights movement, but also the labor movement we're talking about. So just get back to this question. What what has happened to the progressive movement now that just seems so different than hands-on, get down in the trenches, build a labor movement, fight for civil rights as all one big battle. That's not how people think of progressives these days. Uh, 
I, I do I do believe that we have an educational job to do. And uh, I think that many, many people don't really understand the labor movement. The, uh, the labor movement uh, today, for instance, is the most democratic institution in our country. And we don't talk about it enough, and it's not talked about enough. It's more integrated than business. Every Sunday morning is most people go to segregated churches. The school system is not quite integrated. And even though we've tried to integrate it, but the labor movement is the most integrated institution in this country. And the labor movement has begun to um, to be activated. All over the city, for instance, teachers are going on strike. Actors are going on strike. Uh, they are saying to this country, we want to be heard. We want to be respected. We want to have decent wages. And uh, I, I think we don't talk about it enough. Uh, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what's happening in our educational institutions because uh, I haven't been involved as much as I should be. Uh, but we have to be our own ambassadors. Mm. And uh, we are not quite there yet. Now, the the civil rights movement is uh, going through changes. And uh, I, I think it doesn't have the leadership that it had before. And I think that it is developing new, important leadership. And I think that it does have, at base, coalition politics. The, uh, the NAACP, for instance, uh, began to understand early that economic rights were very important. And now they incorporated the economy and justice for workers in 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 their push toward freedom. Mm -hmm. But I think that we do have a long way to go. And unfortunately, this year, next year, and the following year, I think that we have to get on the ball and understand that coalition politics is very important and very uh, needed. Yeah, in the book, uh, Norman, uh, you and Velma both talk a lot about this word coalition. That's another thing that jumped out at me. I think two things of your book, you know, well, lots jumps out. It's a great book. But two things that were unexpected in the book was the emphasis you place on building coalitions, early coalitions with the labor movement, that were first incorporating African American and Black voices, and then all sorts of other coalitions. Mm -hmm. And you you emphasize this all the way through. And in the in the in the epilogue of the book, or, or you know, toward the end, you re-emphasize the need for coalitions. Norman or, or Velma, whoever wants to go there, can you just talk a little more about why we need coalitions? What a coalition is? Why we can't all live in our separate little bubbles? Yes. But we have to come together and work on things. And one other question, what sort of issues are big enough to drive us together to form a coalition, whether it's white and black or, you know, Christian and atheist or older and younger? There have got to be things that are important enough where we can build a coalition around it. Maybe you could name a few of those, but also just tell us about your own coalition building and why we need to do it again. Okay. You well, coalition 
is the organization of a group uh, and group or groups based on common uh, self-interest in which the the emphasis is on that that which the groups have in common and to act on that hmm. uh we 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 see that uh there is a organization called the leadership conference for civil and human rights mm -hmm. which is the major chief lobbying arm of the, the civil and human rights movement that presses and watchdogs Congress and the president on civil rights, civil and human rights issues to make sure that existing legislation is is enforced and where and and where need be strengthened and 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 further built. Uh, it's a coalition that, that operates on consensus. Uh, for example, there is a, a need to for voting rights legislation to counter efforts at voter suppression were the qualifications for voting are made more stringent, are made more difficult, in fact, to restrict in voter participation. The uh, Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights and it's a coalition of civil rights, trade union, religious organizations, women's groups, um, press, press uh, during the early years of the Biden administration for voting rights legislation, which was thwarted by a filibuster in the United States Senate, but that's still very much a part of the agenda. That's an issue, that's a, a basic issue in terms of making registr registration to vote as easy as possible mm. so that there is the great involvement, great involvement, and in fact, moving toward a majoritarian strategy in the pursuit of racial equality and economic justice. Mm -hmm. And the the leadership conference on civil rights was created by A. Philip Randolph, one of our mentors, and Byatt Rustin, one of our mentors. And coalition politics li lives today and is uh it, the result of it was the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and 1965. The Voting the, Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act, yes. And it's very interesting. M Maya Wiley is the daughter of George Wiley, who was a civil rights activist. And I think he drowned it. Or early earlier years, hmm. but he was a civil rights activist, and I think it is being passed on quietly, but uh, but firmly. She heads the leadership conference today. Yes, yes. One thing I wanted to uh, just mention on in in passing was Norman. I I think I referred to this in that little passage I wrote about how. You see each other as friends, uh, which seems obvious, but not not all married couples are. And that friendship is extraordinary. But part of that was honed through the loss of your sight and this this weird 
series of cataract operations that seemed to go wrong. And then later you found out it was a, a genetic uh, thing that goes back into, I guess, y- you know, you get from your parent, your parents or your, your mother, there's, it's pretty rare uh, condition. How, how, just on a personal note, how has that unfolded when did that happen? I, I I I know the dates, but I don't want to thumb through the book. Um, when did you you know become uh, have all this problem with sight and 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 being impaired? What were those years? In two thousand four. Yeah, I went to the doctor hmm. to have cataracts removed, and as the cataracts were removed, I lost sight. Uh, the doctor re-examined me and said that the the removal of the cataracts was flawless, and 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 at first couldn't couldn't really figure out why why I lost sight hmm. until until I went to a, a, a specialist who said that I was the victim of a disease passed on from the mother to the son with a fancy title of labor's optical hereditary neuropathy mm. uh, affecting the uh, the specific nerve. Um, and I, I remember um, mm. feeling, oh, when I lost this, this sight, feeling at a loss, somewhat depressed, because um, uh, as an activist, and I had taken for granted uh, having sight and seeing, seeing, reading, uh, speaking, he always read a lot, and uh, uh, it was Velma who uh, provided support and uh, friend and encouraged me to to find a way to keep on keeping on with the keeping on, and uh, I uh, began having. My assistant, with whom I, I worked, uh, uh, as I projected ideas, uh, when I spoke, I gave speeches, and the speeches were typed, typed in large print so that I could, in fact, read them and project mm. uh, effectively speaking. And I, so that uh, I found a way to keep on uh, speaking and, and addressing um, key audiences, unions, civil rights, and community organizations as a part of my ongoing work. Uh, I I think that uh, today I. Uh, found a way uh, to continue to be mobile. I don't travel as much as I did, but when I do travel, I um, am able to uh, get assistance in in checking in at an airport, boarding a plane, and uh, (laughs) being met at the uh, destination, airport destination, when the plane lands, mm-hmm. and escorted to the meeting or or convention or speaking engagement uh, to which I I'm I'm going, uh, so that uh, I find today that I'm able to to function uh, pretty well even with the loss of sight. And, by the way, mm. the uh, the title of the book is based on Norman's uh, experiences 
And my saying to him, after he got, I think, five minutes of applause mm. after um, a, a, a an A. Philip Randolph meeting, my saying to him, uh, you know, well, his his friend said to him, boy, that was wonderful. Um, how did you do it? Uh, how did you remember? And uh, I said to him and to the friend, you know, we are climbing the rough side of a mountain. Mm -hmm. And in the words of an old Negro spiritual, you got to keep climbing in mm -hmm. order to be a success. And our success is based on our principles and our knowledge and our mentors, A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin. And we will continue to climb the mm. rough side of the mountain mm. because we do have ladders. We, The rough side of the mountain is not smooth. And the smooth side, you fall off. And the rough side, you can hold on. Mm. And for us, the rough side is composed of the operating principles mm -hmm. that we have inherited from the legacy of our mentors, A. Philip Randolph, who was the nation's greatest black labor leader, and by Rustin, his most outstanding colleague, a civil rights leader in his own right, arrested over 20 times. Uh, we, the, and the, those operating principles are we are committed to a society in which racial equality and economic justice will prevail, believing that Blacks can make the most progress by simultaneously confronting the barriers of race and class, that in the pursuit of racial equality and economic justice, we adopt a majoritarian strategy involving coalition politics. Hmm. For, for us, we think that Blacks ought to aggressively and militantly pursue racially equality and economic justice. But being a numerical and racial minority, they ought to do so in such a way as to maximize friends and minimize enemies, mm -hmm. to generate majority support. And uh, as we referred to before, for us, the core, the essence of the coalition is an alliance between the trade union movement and the civil rights movement mm. in organized labor and black, black community. Uh, comparatively speaking, Randolph in his day said that there were pretty few black millionaires, not very many more blacks who owned or ran, ran or managed large businesses or corporations. Blacks, if they were employed or employed as workers, <clears throat> and being the most historically exploited of workers, they had a direct economic bread and butter interest in participating at all levels in that movement that's about improving the lives of working people, namely the trade union movement. Mm -hmm. The other operating principles that we uh, follow and, and, and are essential to our activism are the commitment to liberation for that Self-liberation, by that we mean any group that is mistreated or, or oppressed or discriminated against should take the initiative to challenge the unfair and unjust status quo in which they find themselves. We believe a co commitment to mass action, the march, the picket line, the boycott, some means by which those who have the problem, along with their allies, can confront key de decision makers in pressing for change mm -hmm. and uh, and commitment to nonviolence. By that, we do not mean passive non-resistance, but the use of nonviolence is an integral part of direct mass action. 
So those operating principles are the are the, the the means that we use to climb the mountain in our continuing struggle for racial equality and economic justice. Mm -hmm. And uh, you mentioned, uh, you asked us to mention those things that can bring coalitions together now. Mm. Voting, voting rights are very, very important to mm. Blacks, Hispanics, all, 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 all groups. A woman's right to choose mm. is very important to not just women, but the men who love them mm. and who care about them. And I think that is very, very important uh, and uh, will be significant in the coming year years. Mm. You, your sentence back there, maximize friends and minimize enemies. Yes. My producer, Ernie, just sent me a little text saying, is the mantra for 2024. Aha. Uh -huh. you know, that's yes. what we've got to do, maximize yes, friends and minimize enemies. You know, yes. there's a quote in your book that I like, um, that I just want you to explore a little bit. Um, let's see, who's writing? I think in this instance, it's Norman's voice. Um, I don't think young people in America today have that feeling about being part of a movement with yeah. clear objectives yeah. that makes a transition from protest to political action. And that's too bad. When we were marching and organizing and teaching, all kinds of people, black and white, were involved. We and they were part of a movement that passed groundbreaking, comprehensive civil rights legislation. We don't see much of that now. And I think that's a real challenge to all of us. Uh, but I just want you to expound on that a little bit, because you're in touch with so many people who have been part of the civil rights and the labor movement now for the better part of a century. And um, you have a unique perspective to look at our moment and a younger generation and offer some words of counsel and advice that I think the rest of us should just listen to humbly. So expound on that quote a little bit and tell us, you know, in, in the dark of the night, how, how do you see things in terms of the next generation following up on some of this work? Where are we at? Mm. Well, I think... For the current generation, we've seen such group, groups as Black Lives Matter emerge and, de and engage in demonstrations, particularly in reaction and response to instances of police brutality in in, in tragic deaths at the hands hands of police um but one of the things that is needed is linking unknown caller that involvement and the involvement of you know, involvement in a broader sense and recognize that the issue of police behavior is part of a, a larger institution, larger group institution of a function of, of government. Oh, wow. And that uh, I think that the, the defining issues uh, such as um, the fight for a decent livable livable wage, uh, the fight for uh, the fight to deal with and decrease the debt that students have mounted to mm -hmm. get and maintain college. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, th that it's it's these issues 
that we think need to be put into a political context and see how, how in fact, and in, in, in that the, that the that uh, today's youth need to be engaged in action that that focuses and presses government and elected Out officials of it, to respond. Okay, and, good for that. And it seems to me that that's that that that's the challenge and the and the mission that 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 uh, we face today as we reach out and and and, and involve young people hmm. yeah it would seem to me that a lot of our younger people and people my age too um uh and, and all all ages you know we tend to live in our own little bubbles and so-called social media hasn't helped that yeah. We just talk to people like us. We don't reach out and form coalitions because we don't know anybody except people who are already in our little bubble. Oh, yes. Yes. I want to take a minute and just look through the book. I, there's some incredible pictures here. We're looking at climbing the rough side of the mountain. And uh, Velma has told us the story that goes with that. Um, this is a little bit informal, but here's a picture of Velma a couple oh, of years ago. Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> ah. Oh, boy. And, um, then here are some of the folks in your family. And yeah. then uh, some of the some of the protest pictures here, um, you know, holding signs up, yeah. doing things. There's a yeah. good there's a good collection of pictures here. While I'm looking through these and showing them, talk a little bit about that time when Martin Luther King Jr. came in and sat down on the floor with his legs crossed and you guys were sitting around drinking tea and talking uh, about things. Tell us a little bit about your working with him, because obviously this is someone everybody's interested in. And you you were talking about the fact that people were sort of seeing him as a celebrity and a leader. But when he was killed, how you were remembering him as a man and how much more he was than this symbol. And he's sort of now you go and look at the statue on in Washington of him and how he's almost lost in that because he's this symbol, but you remember him as a man. Let's go there for a minute. Um, here you are speaking a couple of years ago. Oh gosh. Yeah. The time went by quick. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. And here uh, you are, here you are. There's the famous balcony where oh, yeah. Luther King was shot. And then you, you guys are right here in the picture, Norman, uh, you're all there. And I just want to tell people, you know, you're looking at not only wise human beings who have been leaders in the great fight of our time, but you are also looking at people who were there and saw things. So talk to us about Martin Luther King Jr. and how you saw him as a man and knew him. And, you know, I loved one part of your book where you were saying, you know, you you worked with him, but you can't claim to have been friends in the sense that you had a working relationship. I believed every word you said after that because you know people people like to amplify connections. Yes. Oh, you know, they met they they met somebody one you know, but you you actually had a working relationship with him, yeah. and um, you knew him. Tell us about that. Well, in 1964, in the uh, the. A presidential election year in which Lyndon Johnson and Goldwater were the convincing candidates. Martin Luther King uh, d and conducted a six city get out the vote tour in uh, northern cities urging people to get out and vote. And uh, I helped organize the uh, the uh, the tour. But I remember especially uh, where we had then kind of an informal discussion with Martin Luther King and uh, his uh, key assistant, Andrew Young, 
by Rustin was a part of it. In the, the, the meeting, Velma and I were there. And, and Don Slayman from the AFL CIO. Yeah. And the the discussion of the focus of the discussion was where King should go next and where the focus of his future campaign ought to be. And uh we discussed I think it was King who raised that he felt that he ought to go north mm. and particularly ought to go to Chicago. Mm. Uh And this was shortly after the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 65 that, that this discussion took place. And I remember Brian Rustin trying trying to make the case for King campaigning in the South to, to make sure that now that the Voters' discrimination was eliminated by the Voting Rights Act, which has now been weakened by Supreme Court decision. But then, that 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 he ought to be mobilizing in in a massive way uh, black voters in the South to, in fact, engage politically and begin to to address the economic and social problems facing blacks and that that and and uh and that and that he would face a much more much different situation in a northern city like Chicago where blacks have been voting for some time or blacks uh, held, held political office in this city of Chicago, uh, where blacks were aldermen and blacks were uh, a part of the what was then the daily machine, mayor daily being the mayor of Chicago. And uh, and that he would find that blacks reacted and responded politically as a as a part of that machine and uh, generating black support for for issues independent of that. Independent of that machine was would not be an easy task. Uh, that uh, there were institutions in, in a city like Chicago in which the, uh, this it's which discrimination was in. It was a part of the institution, and that that didn't respond simply or directly to a march. Uh, yeah, yes, and I, he found that out, by the way. And in and, the book, you talk about the fact that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and yourselves were sort of shocked by the level of the brutality and the racism that he confronted in the marches there in Chicago in the North. I wasn't. No, you weren't, because you 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 knew about it. Absolutely. Going back to getting that rock in your. That's in your right. Face. It was really a brick. It yeah, was, brick. Yeah, yeah. But, but, but you know, uh, he was convinced that he should go to to Chicago, mm -hmm. and there was no stopping him. I think because uh, the uh, the civil rights movement in Chicago really needed him, and mm -hmm. they were 
uh, exhibiting uh, their their will, you know. Mm. But uh, you know, he was he was a very he was a very simple man who, by Rustin, taught about nonviolence. Mm. I, I think there was a movie called Boycott. Hmm. where a character uh, by at Rustin went to his home and there were guns and everything and he said no 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 you're not gonna you're not gonna lead a movement with guns and he taught him about nonviolence and by the way he also uh, made up the the uh, bylaws of the um, Southern Christian Leadership Conference. Mm. And by the way, he there is a film now on Bayard Rustin, and it's just beginning to let people know of his his character and his important role in the civil rights movement. And I do I recommend it. It's it's not. It's not the complete history, and I think that there's going to have to be another movie <laughs> about Bayard Rustin, but it is worth seeing. Well, if you have the, if you're in touch with some of the folks who are involved in the making of that, put them in touch with my producer Ernie. Uh huh. So we can interview them, and we'll 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 make a point of trying to promote that. Oh, that's very good. That's very so. Please good. let us know when we get off here. Ernie will stay on with you. Don't don't hang up, as it were, when we're finished. Talk to Ernie a little bit about who these people are, because we can we can get behind that a little bit. Okay. By, by the way, I think that uh, the Obamas, the production company for the Obamas, hmm. uh, was uh, instrumental. Well, you know the Obamas. There's nice pictures of you in the book meeting with President Obama. How did that go? That went very well, but we did we didn't spend a lot of time with them, although he he was very important uh as a figure and I think as a man. Uh his family uh was sort of untouched uh by the you know, the scandals and uh Mm. Um, and 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 I think he's. I I think that we're doing a, um, we're doing a uh, uh, article. Actually, it, they're doing an article about us mm. in in the Times, and the author of the article has agreed to uh, make it her business. Mm. to get to the the Obamas I think, uh with our book mm. and with our presence uh in, in yeah there's the a picture of you with the, with uh, President Obama and also of course with President Clinton I yes. mean basically you've met everybody who mattered for the last yes, yes. 70 well, years <laughs> that's true but we we should probably be a little more pushy than we are I think so <laughs> because you've got plenty to push about <laughs> you know you're you you actually have met and know everybody you've worked with everybody and you haven't dropped any names at all but I just want to go to something in the book that I want you to talk a, lot, a little bit. I'm going to read from a section that you have toward the end on things that you'd think need to be done. A major part of our efforts is being directed at the unfinished business of the demands of the 1963 March. And these are things that are unfinished from 1963 to now. Talk yeah. about coalitions and what young people can be doing. Here are your priorities. And it's not all about me, 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 or you know, one little group. The, you think big. Here are your priorities. A national federal jobs program aimed at training and employing all willing and able to work. Yes. An American trade policy that no longer places manufacturing workers at a competitive disadvantage in, in the global economy. A living wage for workers. Yes. A quality education for all. Universal quality health care. America's prison industrial complex, protection of our natural environment. You know, I loved what you concentrate on is not yourselves, 
and it's not any kind of sense of self-vindication in this book. You go to the, here you are at the end of such a long arc of activism and you're you're listing the unfinished things that need to continue to be worked on. And what amazed me in reading that is none of it's trivial. It's all the real stuff. Yeah. It's not getting bogged down in little little stuff. Yeah. You think in terms of big things. And I, I just love that about your book. It's so inspiring. By the way, just once again, here's the cover. It's in your bookstore, Climbing the Rough Side of the Mountain, The Extraordinary Story of Love, Civil Rights, and Labor Activism by Norman Hill and Velma Murphy Hill. You know, I talk to a lot of people. I write myself. In this book, you will encounter people, if I can say this without an offending anybody else I might interview, they know what they're talking about. They've been there, done that. This is the real deal. So I can't recommend this book highly enough. It's a slice of history. It's a love story. It's passionate. It's self-effacing. It's honest. And it's low key. Um, meeting you through the book has been a, a great privilege and an honor. And I, 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 so let's go back to that list I read there and, and, kind of finish up with that a little bit in in the folks you talk to these days are people working on these things in coalition or not there is not enough coalition hmm. um i i think reverend barbara uh i'm i'm not even sure where black lives matters whether they are coalitionists, but mm. I think they are at least on the surface coalitionists. You mentioned I, Reverend Barber uh, yes. in, in the book as someone who's doing something positive. Yes. And you 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 sort of hold him up as an example of someone who is, I guess, a coalitionist, would you yes. say? Yes, I think so. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I think that we 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 should be bringing people from the civil rights movement, the labor movement, from the religious community. We should be bringing them together mm. over priorities for uh, 2024 and 2025. We should be bringing them together, and we are not. And we were thinking about developing a clearinghouse for uh, discussions about bringing people together. Mm. And maybe we, maybe we will, maybe we will. And I know that there, there should be, mm. um, there should be the beginning of the real coalition uh, for change. Yeah. You we're know. thinking of no, uh, bringing together uh, the uh, the emerging youth with the veteran veteran leaders of the movement yeah um is it, so that uh, there can be uh, you know, the emerging youth and their with the, with their focus and immediate and and, and concerns with, to get together with the experience of uh, of veteran uh, activists of the movement, and uh, so that there can be um, a meshing of, and in fact, youth can positively profit from the the lessons and experiences of of veteran activists, and mm. veteran activists can listen with uh not with a deaf ear, not with a um an attitude of we're gonna teach you, but that we're gonna learn together mm. how to forge a society that is for everyone. Mm. Well anything that uh, we can do with our little podcast and outreach that we've got to help host that conversation or, you know, just keep us informed. Anybody you think we ought to be interviewing, uh, you know, Velma, if you think of someone, whether it's, a you know, who's made a movie or written a book or another activist, if you, if they need to be heard from, um, uh -huh. please let us know. 
uh, send us, you know, you can send us one name or a hundred and we'll interview them all. And, and any coalition you want to do, um, you know, and you need any help hosting that or whatever, just let us know what we can do. Well, I really do. We appreciate that Mm. because it could be the, the beginning, uh, of, of change Mm. in society. And it's really needed by the way. It's yeah. really needed. And yeah. we thank you for having us. Uh, we, we're, we're also going to speak to Jennifer. Yes. I think she facilitated this. She did indeed. I'm going to send her a big thank you. <clears throat> She's a lovely lady and has done a yeah. lot for me over the years in terms of all the books I've published. But uh, this is one of the best things she's done for me is introducing you to, to us because this has just been such a privilege to talk to you both. Well, thank you very much for having us. Yeah, well, hey, the th- it's all the other way. <laughs> I thank you. And thank you for being there. Thanks for everything you've been through, climbing the rough side of the mountain for the rest of us and then bringing us the story. It's a wonderful book. And I, you know, I just, I, I am so touched that you would take the time to talk to me. Thank you so much. And thank you. Thank you.